the key to wealth in life is very simple. I can tell you in one sentence how to be wealthy. Leverage yourself as much as you can without getting a margin call. People say Bitcoin is so speculative and, and so volatile. And that's true, but the question is compared to what? Real estate, yeah, it's gone up in a, in a very predictable way, but like right now they increased the interest rates, boom, the whole real estate market froze. So there's always dangers that the conditions will change. And I think we should make the case that Bitcoin is one of the most certain things. It's kind of a crazy idea if you think about it. Bitcoin is basically like a startup money. And money is something that is only controlled by governments in the last hundreds of years. Just like America was like startup nation, like let's let's kick the biggest empire. Literally, they had this thought of we'll meet the biggest empire's army on a battlefield and we'll win. It, it's just a crazy thought. So it's the same with, with Bitcoin. The Blockware Marketplace is super cool. Basically, Mason's firm already helps investors and institutional investors on Wall Street get into Bitcoin mining with his giant data centers, but he wanted to make it even easier for the average person to get into this. So now with the Blockware Marketplace, with the click of a button, you can buy your own Bitcoin miner from the comfort of your own home and have it instantly start mining for you straight into a Bitcoin wallet of your choosing. On the Blockware Marketplace, you can see a bunch of miners for sale, you can see what the miner is, the price, the data center location that the miner is located in, the hash rate, the estimated revenue you're going to be making based on the current price of Bitcoin and stuff, and there are miners in all price ranges listed on there right now. Once you see a miner you want to look into more, simply click on it, and then you can see the serial number, how long it's been online for, you can see charts of the miner's historical performance, and once you're ready to buy a miner, simply click buy, follow the instructions, and then that miner that is already online in their data center will be instantly assigned to you. And that's it. You are now mining Bitcoin, getting all the benefits of mining without ever having to do any of the setup or maintenance yourself. So go to marketplace.blockwaresolutions.com to take a peek at all the miners that are listed for sale right now. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Blockware Intelligence Podcast. This week I have on Shimon from Unchained. Welcome. Hey, good to be here, Joe. Absolutely. Glad to have you. Um, let's jump right into it. How did you get involved in the Bitcoin space and, you know, like, what is your professional background before Bitcoin? Yeah, so I come from like a traditional finance background. Um, so I, I went to business school uh, in the U.S. here uh, to study marketing. Uh, but before that, I worked uh, in the Forex uh, industry in one of the largest uh, brokers uh, in the world. And then, uh, you know, after business school, I did very traditional uh, strategy consulting work at BCG. But after BCG in San Francisco, I actually worked for a cryptography startup in uh, Palo Alto. It was like really funny because many of the top cryptographers in the world were professors at Stanford and they were either advisors of the company or they worked uh, for the company. And uh, what's funny is everybody was talking about Bitcoin and that was like 2013 and everybody spoke about how this is like this huge breakthrough in math and, and you know, the Byzantine generals problem and like all the implications it can have. But like the conversation always ended, uh, it's not going to be money because like the government's going to ban it because it's like too good to be true. And it's funny to see those arguments just cycle, you know, with each cycle, you get like a bunch of people making that argument. Um, and it's, it's so funny because like in 2019, uh, my, um, my buddy and I, that we worked together at VCG, we saw like a, a white paper that they published about like digital currencies and it was just so wrong. And, you know, BCG are like the best minds in the world, pretty much. They hire the best people, but their, their concept of like what this thing is was just completely backwards. And it was all about like, how can you gate it on the on-ramps and off-ramps? so that government can control it. And that was like their whole premise. So, so yeah, sadly, I didn't buy any in 2013. Uh, but then, uh, you know, I worked a bunch uh, in, in Silicon Valley uh, in marketing and uh, different startups, took some public, took some, uh, you know, to acquisition. But then in 2016, I was working on my own startup and my best friend in Israel, uh, his wife was doing a PhD in math in an Israeli university. Uh, that was not Stanford. By the way, Israelis are very good at encryption. The RSA uh, algorithm that everybody uses for, for like all encryption, pretty much. The S guy is Shamir. He was like an Israeli professor. So the professor there, lecture number one, he just told them, and this is a PhD program. He said, whatever you do, go home, buy Bitcoin. I'll tell you why next time, like in the next lecture, but like just go home and buy it. And so 
that's what got me into the into the rabbit hole and I like you know bought my first Bitcoin in 2016 because I listened to the Israeli professor not the Stanford professor and uh, and yeah, yeah the rest is history so uh, I, I basically after my startup I joined Kraken as head of growth uh, after that I was head of growth at OK Group so both OKX and OK Coin for like three years and now I'm the CMO of Unchained uh, which is, it feels so great because like, I just wanted to be Bitcoin only in my efforts, uh, because I personally hold only Bitcoin. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with other, uh, with other cryptos. I just like see them more as like a VC type investment. And I'm not like, that's not my DNA. That's not how I invest my personal money. So I'm happy to be at a place that's uh, Bitcoin only. Uh, but yeah, that's a little bit about me. Yeah, that's awesome. It's cool to always hear people's background and how they got into Bitcoin. It is an interesting point how people recycle the same arguments against Bitcoin, like the governments will ban it. And it's also interesting, and or it's like money laundering or whatnot. And it's also interesting seeing uh, uh, the BlackRock uh, CEO, you know, saying it was money laundering in the past. And now he's like, oh, it's digital gold. And then I also I feel like there's steps of understanding Bitcoin, like, oh, it's digital gold, which is, you know, pretty pretty powerful oh it could be like a treasury reserve asset or oh it could be like the global money so it's like there's different stages in your understanding of what bitcoin is and why it's important so quite fascinating um i know yeah. you so like you mentioned you you led growth at kraken and okx do with that position like how did you or how do you think about global bitcoin adoption and accelerating that yeah, so what's really fascinating, uh, OKX was a much more global experience. Uh, Kraken was very much focused in the US and Europe uh, when I was there in 2019. But with OKX, I, I basically saw that every country has a very different way of looking at, um, at Bitcoin. So, for example, uh, many Asian cultures, they're big into gambling and they love it. It's not like considered a vice. And so for them saying like, hey, this is a speculative asset that can appreciate, that's actually a good selling point. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to understand like the, the deep technical bowels of like the blockchain that powers Bitcoin. Uh, and, and there's more countries like that where it's, it's basically the whole idea is speculation is good. Then there's other countries where inflation is a problem. And, you know, as someone who has uh, experienced, not experienced it, I mean, I was extremely lucky. So I was born in Bulgaria and we left uh, in 1990, when communism collapsed, we left and moved to Israel. Now, the interesting part is Bulgaria had a hyperinflation after we left, like in the in the mid 90s. And Israel had had a hyperinflation before we arrived in the mid 80s. So I saw and heard about the effects of hyperinflation without actually having to experience it. So I'm super, super lucky uh, on a personal level. But, uh, you know, this is no joke. Uh, I, I've seen, and I'm not talking about Venezuelan hyperinflation where it's just like crazy. I'm just talking about like 100% year over year, you know, price difference. It's like, it's something that's completely manageable uh, if you're working and your salary adjusts. But if you're like on a pension or if you have any sort of fixed income, it completely destroys you after like, you know, three or four years, you have like nothing left. And And, you know, I've seen like university professors, uh, retired university professors rummage through garbage cans. That's something you don't usually see like uh, in, in the West. And so either having this as, as a history or it happening right now, like, for example, now in Turkey, it's happening and like Argentina, you know, there's these countries that they're just like gradually devaluing their currency or countries where it happened in the past where people are sensitive to it. Uh, there you can talk about a store of value. And you can really talk about something where, you know, the day-to-day -day fluctuations don't really matter. As long as over four or five years, it protects your value. It really resonates with people. Um, and then you have other, other countries. For example, Switzerland is like really big into gold. They, they had a gold standard for the longest, I think. They're the last ones to, to drop the gold standard. So they also understand that idea of a non-speculative store of value where it's just like you just want it to hold your value. Um, but yeah, it's very different and I'm, I'm sure it will keep evolving. Like, you know, like Vietnam, for example, they're huge into this play to earn. Uh, you know, they had these cryptos that are like Axie Infinity and stuff like that because like they don't, they're super, super hungry. They're super smart. 
uh, and they don't have too many avenues to monetize that potential. So they're literally looking for any option to like make money. Um, so yeah, it's very different. But that's one of the things I really love about Bitcoin, which is like with all its layers, it can be like very, very different things for different people. Like, you know, you can use it without even being exposed to the price by, you know, just like using it to transfer value and immediately transfer back uh, to, um, you know, to like either fiat or whatever else your actual store value is. Uh, I'm also very bullish on stable coins on, on Bitcoin, if they can ever do it. Like I was at a BitDevs meetup uh, yesterday where they were talking about like potentially a way uh, to do that. Uh, but that would be a complete game changer because the, there's a lot of the world uh, like El Salvador and stuff. Uh, they, they don't hold Bitcoin because like the volatility is too much. Like many of these people, you know, let's say you have a pupuseria and you make like 10% or 20% margin or even 50% margin for the day. And then you need that to eat, right? And, and you know, you maybe save 5% of your money, which means that a fluctuation of more than 5% completely destroys you. So it's not a feasible way to, uh, to interact with the world. So yeah, we'll see where it goes. Yeah. So it sounds like, I guess the world is a very big place with a lot of different people and they all respond to different narratives and, and, uh, things differently. And that's, you know, some people adopt Bitcoin for different ways. So that's very interesting. Um, I guess, what do you think is maybe one thing that is needed to accelerate Bitcoin adoption? Like what is, I mean, I feel like the community makes a lot of podcasts, produces a lot of content, go, they go on CNBC, people go on Bloomberg. Like what is something that maybe the community is not doing or companies are not doing that you think could help accelerate Bitcoin adoption? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm pretty much making this my, my main focus. Uh, I mean, one of my main focuses at Unchained uh, because of my background. So like my, my thesis is that capital is, is not equally distributed, right? So like a, a very few, a, a, a few people hold most of the capital. Now, how can we convince them to care about Bitcoin? I think that's something that not enough people are doing because like those people, you know, if you're a wealthy, either think of like a investment banking partner, a law firm partner, VC partner, like the top of these like industries that are very, very selective and, um, you know, it, it's really hard to, to succeed there. So if you make it to the top, what kind of content do you consume? You know, like I, I think nobody has cracked that, um, that theme, like you have lots of companies uh, doing very introductory level uh, materials. Uh, what is Bitcoin? You know, who, you know, all the, like think of the, the cash app materials are very, very good. If you don't know anything about Bitcoin, I would recommend go to the cash app website. You learn the, you'll get the most amount of information in the shortest amount of time. Uh, and then there's like other people that uh, target different segments, but I don't think anybody's targeting the wealthy, uh, educated people. Uh, and, and it's not easy, uh, you know, a, to get their attention and, and, uh, B to like, uh, sustain their attention. So I think there's a lot of room to like write about Bitcoin in ways that resonate with those people. And I don't know, uh, what that is, but I, I think it's more like evergreen pieces, more, more pieces that are thinking about deep issues, deep, either cultural issues or, um, you know, like I really like the, the Jeff Booth stake, uh, because it's, it's a thesis that can really resonate with like wealthy people, which is like, Hey, technology is deflationary. That's a fact. Like we all know that like the better we are at making things, the cheaper those things are. Uh, but also we have all of this debt that requires all of this inflation. And the, the, the big insight I had from Jeff Booth's work is that CPI consumer price index is literally just the difference between like the money being printed and the technological deflation. So you can have like, you know, 7% increase in money, 5% technological deflation that gives you a 2% CPI. That's like a very profound insight. And I remember even when I was at BCG, people intuitively get it. So, uh, I remember there was a partner there that told me something like, the key to wealth in life is very simple. I can tell you in one sentence how to be wealthy. Leverage yourself as much as you can without getting a margin call. And this can be about anything. It can be about your career. It can be about your real estate. It can be literally whatever it is. Try to leverage as much as you can, but like don't get a margin call. So, you know, 
it's either really trivial or really profound, but the point is people understand that you have to leverage yourself because otherwise it's really hard to outcompete the the money printing uh, in terms of the you know the, just the yield that you get the the risk reward of of different instruments you know it's usually not very good uh, versus the money being printed so uh, so but but how do we package that information or how do we come with other narratives where we end with and this is why Bitcoin is the answer to that. You know what I mean? Like, I think people are still, they understand that money printing is going on. Like, if you look at wealthy people uh, throughout the history, uh, they don't keep their wealth in cash. Like, they they know, they intuitively know. They invest in stuff, they, they leverage, they borrow against it. Like, all of the things that we learned as Bitcoiners, you know, wealthy people know that. But, like, why is Bitcoin a better investment asset than, for example, the NASDAQ? Uh, or then real estate. And Michael Saylor has some really, really good points. Uh, I think he's the closest to to talking about that. But but even his stuff, I think, can be made more crisp. Like two, two of his points that I really like is he says, look, when you invest in an index fund, for example, you just have a risk that the executives of these companies will not make the best decisions, you know? And so, yeah, on average, that risk is lower than if you invest in one company. But still, it's still humans. And you're still like beholden to government regulations. Uh, so like if if now, let's say California passes a regulation that severely increases the tax on, on software engineers, you know, it's it's not going to be very easy to like move all of these people to another state. You know, they have kids that are in school that have their friends. So so like you're still much more beholden to regulation. Uh, when you invest in traditional assets, of course, real estate, he makes that point, which is like, okay, they can just increase your taxes and it completely changes your return um, profile. What, what's interesting is like people say Bitcoin is so speculative and, and so volatile. And that's true. But the question is compared to what? Like, you know, real estate, uh, you know, yeah, it's gone up in a, in a very predictable way. But like, you don't know if it will right now they increase the interest rates boom the whole interest uh, the whole real estate market froze so it's like okay what if you need the money now uh that's lo locked up in real estate versus like so so there's always dangers that the conditions will change and i think we should make the case that bitcoin is one of the most certain things it's not perfectly certain you cannot guarantee what the price will be a year from now but just like compared to other uh investment vehicles but I think we can still do a better job at explaining that. Uh, you know, one one other really good take that he had, uh, I actually made an infographic out of it. He said, you know, people say Bitcoin uses too much energy. And, and that's like a very common uh, criticism. So like the normal rebuttals are two, uh, the, the good ones. Either people say, look, it's my money that I spend on it and I can use the energy for whatever I want. It's It's kind of the libertarian perspective which basically says, look, like you can't tell me how to spend my money. That's kind of a weak argument because like people on, on the other side can just say, look, this is a negative externality. Like I'm actually paying for your gains, you know, like you're boiling the oceans. And so, so it's like your profits come at my expense. It's very hard to rebut that. I completely disagree with that argument because I think that, you know, the solution to climate change is technological and it's using more energy. It's not using less energy. Like if we want to solve climate change, let, let's build like a thousand nuclear power plants that suck the CO2 out of the air. You know, it's doable. We have the technology to do it. But beyond that, it's it's a hard argument to have. The second argument people say is like, oh, no, but actually the fiat industry uses a lot more because like you need all the warships and all the, you know, the the it's not free to, to create this money. It's just like we pay for it in other means. But there the problem is that like everybody knows you cannot live without money, but like people say you can live without Bitcoin. So it's like, again, that's a rebuttal that's not very good. What did Michael Saylor say? He said, let's look at value created per unit of electricity used. Let's look at Google. Let's look at airlines. Let's look at finance. How much electricity does the industry use? And how much value appreciation happened during the, I think it took like a certain time period, like let's say 10 years. How much electricity did Google use in these 10 years? And, and how much value did they create just by their stock price, their market cap appreciation? And he showed that Bitcoin actually creates the most amount of value per unit of energy used. Boom, that's it. You can't argue with that. You literally cannot argue with that. So like, I think that's what's missing. Like, how do we come up with arguments that are strong, that resonate with wealthy people, uh, it, whoever does that uh, is going to take Bitcoin uh, forward 
you know, by, by a huge amount. And, uh, and I hope to be uh, one of those people. So like I'm, I'm working with content creators that are deep, uh, that, are, that create high quality content to sponsor them because I really think it's, it's important. Uh, it, it's really a service we can do. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like being able to convince, you know, wealthy people in America and around the world that Bitcoin is, is actually very important and it's something that you can hold. And if you do hold it for a significant amount of time, you're going to out likely outperform many of the other assets that you hold. And yeah, it's interesting your point about like holding equities or a specific equity. It's like another idea is if a company's just spitting off, you know, a billion dollars of free cash flow per year, not only do you have, you know, management risk, regulation risk, but you also have like capitalism risk, like capitalism is brutal. I mean, there's, if you're, if you're just churning profits, there's going to be people investing in early stage startups that are going to be trying to tackle and take those profits from you. So it's like, nothing is ever guaranteed. And if you, you know, maybe in the short term, that company has pretty safe, consistent profits. But if you zoom out five, 10 years, it's more, you know, likely that Bitcoin's going to still be spitting out block after block, the supply schedule is still going to be the same, no one's going to be able to change that. But will Coca Cola or Google get disrupted in the next five years? I mean, maybe I'd say there's more likely that they'll get disrupted, rather than Bitcoin itself, the supply schedule would, would get disrupted. So yeah, that's a great point. And I would just say, even just to steel man the argument, let's say the, the steel man is like, okay, so then don't pick one company, just buy the index. You know, you can buy the index of like all public companies in the world. You could do that. Uh, but the problem, what I love about your framing of capitalism risk is like, not just the risk of competition, but also there's the risk of like the rules of the game changing. Uh, because capitalism has only existed you could you could argue that in the U.S. it's been kind of a unique thing in the since the 20th century start. Like the 19th century was amazing; it was pure capitalism. But you could also say it was easy to have pure capitalism when you keep expanding to the West and you keep doing these projects that are like guaranteed to do a pro to to make a profit for you. Like, can you imagine like building a rail railroad from the East Coast to the West Coast? Like, that's pretty much guaranteed to print money. You know, so like it's easy to be capitalist then. But then people say, like, after World War II, we had a period of, of cap I mean, the 30s were almost communism in the U.S. Like, FDR did a bunch of, of things. Like, he regulated, like, how many hours can you work on sewing pants in, in New York? Like, it's crazy. Like, I, I read about that time period and it was just crazy. But you could say, okay, whatever. It was the Great Depression. Uh, although you could, you could say that, yeah, the Great Depression led to more kind of socialism um, and so next time we have a big depression, there's a risk that we would get more socialism, like with universal basic income or stuff like that. It's, it's pure socialism. Um, because like, you know, I, I was born in a communist country. Communism is like not universal basic income, but universal basic services, right? So like every, everybody gets everything for free and like everybody has to work. And if you don't show up to work, you go to jail. Literally, that was the Soviet Union in the 1930s. You didn't show up to work, they sent you to the gulag. So it's like, we tell you what to do and we guarantee that you get everything you need. That's pure kind of socialism, but like, you know, it's a sliding scale. Like when FDR says, okay, you're unemployed, instead of you being able to like look for work in New York City, I'm gonna send you to Wyoming to plant forests. Uh, what is that exactly? Uh, so anyway, but after World War II, we had a period of another capitalistic period because like, again, there was so much rebuilding to do in Europe that it was, pure profits, like profits were guaranteed. You could just hire all the like ex soldiers and, and just like, even if they weren't very good at what they were doing, you know, you could still make money. But like, as things get more and more crowded out, like look at Europe, for example, Europe doesn't have uh, growth. And so they tend to be more and more socialistic. And the interesting thing is it doesn't have to be Venezuela style. So I, I read about like what China did uh, after the communists took over China. They, let's say you were a wealthy, a businessman from England that ran, uh, you know, a factory in, in China. So in, in the USSR, what they did when the communists took over, they just took the factory from you, kicked you out of the country. Okay, that's one way of dealing with the problem. What China did was smarter. Ch China basically learned from all the mistakes of the USSR, uh, most learned from most of the mistakes, uh, and, and tried to not repeat them because they, they just like took over the country a bit later. So what, the, what Chinese communists did, they said, look, you have to still work at the factory. Not only that, you cannot leave China. So it's the opposite. You know, the USSR kicked you out of the country. 
Uh, China said, no, you have to stay. And guess what? We have to approve every hire. OK, so the government has like you want to hire uh, more people, just check in with that government office and, and they have to approve the hire. Literally, just just like here, you know, you check that someone is a citizen and they can be lawfully employed. That's what they did. Only they micromanaged every hire. And so they slowly stuffed your your factory with more and more people that were completely useless. Uh, or, or not useless, but like they were less productive than the people you would want to hire ideally, but they still kept the factory alive. And so it, it was a much, much slower kind of bleed into, into your capital. They still took away all your capital, but instead of doing it like overnight, they did it over 10 years. Now, does this remind you of something like all the ESG mandates and all of these like uh, governments that basically say, hey, here's this money, but you can only take it if you do these things for us, you know. Uh, you know, student loans is a great example. Like, you know, the universities couldn't charge what they charge if you could go bankrupt on your student loans, right? So like imagine a world where you just take a loan from the bank, just like a small business takes a loan. It's like, oh, you want to study computer science? Your interest rate is 4%. Oh, you want to study whatever uh, history of ancient Mesopotamia? Your interest rate is 18% because like you have a, a lower likelihood of getting a job that, you know, pays you enough to repay the loan. So if that were the case, tuition would be much, much, uh, much, much uh, lower. But like then the government comes and says, we guarantee everybody a 6% interest rate, no matter what you study. But you now have to hire these like uh, diversity officer or like you have to, uh, you know, teach certain courses that are mandatory. Like, you know, I had to do a diversity training it, you know, in my MBA, like why? I, I did, I'm not a sociology major, you know, I'm not like, it's great if you want to research. I actually think diversity is a great thing, you know, like having a diverse group of people working on a problem, you actually get to a better result than having like everybody coming from the same background working on the same problem. That's that's proven. But let me choose if I want to study that and, and if I want to major in that. No, it was mandatory and, and I'm sure it's getting worse and worse. So. That is a danger when you buy the stock index of the whole world or the stock index of the S&P 500 or, or all the public companies in the US. You never know what regulation the government will come up with. And that's, I think, a much bigger danger or, or not much bigger. It's a different danger. It's basically the danger if you buy the index versus if you buy a single company. Yeah, the danger is that someone will outcompete you. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, thinking about buying the S&P 500 or like a US based index fund, like I feel like there's some sort of selection bias over the last 50, 100 years of picking the U.S., right? Like if you had picked almost any other country, you would have been worse off. So it's like there's no guarantees that the U.S. is going to be the dominant stock market for the next 50 years. So great points there. Um, I, when you're talking about kind of the elite or like the wealthy and like top business schools, you reminded me of uh, Jesse Myers, his article on why the yuppie elite dismissed Bitcoin. And I, I think you have obviously a similar background to Jesse with business school and management consulting. Like, do you remember that article? And like, do you have thoughts on, on your peers in management consulting and business school? Like, do they question Bitcoin? Do they think you're crazy working in Bitcoin? How do you think about, you know, the yuppie elite and Bitcoin today? Yeah, absolutely. So yes, I do. Uh, I did read the article. It's uh, I really liked that article, and I I really re really resonated with it because the uh, yeah I went to BCG San Francisco. Uh, I worked there. Uh, it's it's like so elite that you know the CEO of Google um, used to work in the office of BCG San Francisco. Like it's it's literally the the, the kind of feeder into the big tech companies. Now the thing is. I had two observations. One is that everybody was miserable. Uh, like everybody, in, uh, I mean, not everybody, but like most people were pretty miserable. Um, but the other thing is once you leave consulting and you actually settle into a corporate job, I think life is pretty good for you. Like you don't have to do too much to just have a very easy life, right? So if you think of uh, just like, you know, sending your kids to college and having a nice house and all of that, just show up to work every day and do good work. 
and and you know you, you can do it like versus the startup culture is a bit different because in, in the startup culture you have to hustle you have to it, it's not as linear it's not like you can just join a startup and then just even if you're really good at what you do maybe the startup is too early uh, and so so it's just like uh there's less correlation there between doing good work but like yeah the elite i'm assuming they can do really good work and they can uh they can just like do their thing and and you know have a good outcome so there the incentive of you being open to, to ideas that are uh, heterodox, you know, something that's, you know, maybe if you're right, it's like amazing, but if you're wrong, uh, it's, it, you know, it, it's a huge stigma. Uh, that's just like, even if nobody taught you that, that's kind of the natural way of your being. And I remember one of my biggest kind of red, uh, orange peeling moments without, you know, I didn't know about Bitcoin back then, but it's the first time where I was like, wait a second, all these elite people, they don't necessarily know what they're, what they're talking about. Or, you know, the fact that they make a lot of money doesn't necessarily mean that they make better decisions. Maybe they're just like smarter, you know, maybe their, their IQ is higher and their uh, emotional uh, intelligence is also pretty high. So, so that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to listen to them. The moment I understood this is, and I'm not going to forget this. So I did a project for a huge transportation company. And uh, the it was called the Blue Sky Strategy. So it's basically you look at the, the market like 15 years from now and you read like academic research about like industries uh, that might start or something that might disrupt your industry or like any anything that can be, uh, you know, uh, very different than, not, not incremental, but like very, very different. And you basically plot it on a two by two uh, like chart with, the y-axis being how much potential there is uh and the x-axis are it is like what's the likelihood of of this happening and the the bubble size is whatever like it, there were three dimensions and the idea is like it, most things uh line up on a line so basically the, the more the less likely something is to happen, the more disruptive it is if it happens. That's kind of the idea of a blue sky strategy. And then you you, you look at projects that are outside of the normal line and, and you see, oh, this thing, you know, has a higher likelihood to succeed and it's not disruptive or this thing has a lower likelihood to succeed and it's and it's very disruptive. So you just like try to identify outliers. That's the exercise. And it was a transportation company. So the biggest thing people are talking about, and this was 2012, were drone deliveries, right? Like delivery by drones of like high value items like drugs, like pills or anything that's like doesn't weigh too much. Uh, and, and also if it's time sensitive and everybody was talking on how this will have a huge implication if it happens and if it's autonomous and stuff. Uh, Cause like if, if a person has to like land the drone then it's not as disruptive versus a truck. But if it's like an autonomous drone, super, super disruptive. So I showed this to the partner at BCG and he's like, oh yeah, this, this work is great, but just remove that, remove that observation about the drone delivery. And I'm like, but everybody's talking about it, like in academia or whatever. He's like, no, no, just remove it. I'm like, but seriously, it's, it can be very disruptive. He's like, look, I have a PhD in physics and this thing is not going to happen. And that's it. He just left it at that. And that epitomizes for me, like what's wrong with the elite, which is like, they think that if they know everything about like a subject that it somehow gives them like more authority to predict the future versus no, we don't know what the future will be. You know? Yeah. We don't have, now it's 2023. So in a sense he was right because like, you know, 11 years passed and we still don't have a, autonomous drone deliveries, but like he didn't have a good reasoning uh, and it wasn't a physics issue. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that basically taught me to be a bit more skeptical about what the elite think. Um, and, and also there's another thing that I, I think is very important, which is like, uh, Peter Thiel's saying where if you want to be very wealthy, you have to believe something that other people don't agree with and, and be right about it. Because like, if everybody agrees on something, there's not a lot of alpha to be had because it's already kind of a lot of it is priced in. And so that's why Bitcoin was so excited to me, exciting to me, because I was like, this is all my friends think that I'm, you know, crazy for investing in this. Uh, they actually thought I was crazier to get a job in the space than to put money in the space. Like they said, oh yeah, put money in the space, whatever. It's just like an options on some random tech company. But like, you really want to work there? And you know what else they said? They said like, it's a huge concentration of risk because like if, if a bear market comes, you will both lose your job and your portfolio will go down. So like, 
that's how they think about it. They think about diversification and how do we like protect ourselves from from like, uh, you know, many different scenarios. But the problem is, if that's how you think, you'll never have outsized returns. Like if you think of a startup founder, he's the least diversified. Like he he's literally putting everything, all his reputation, all his money, all his friends and family's money, all his time, everything in this thing that statistically has a 90% chance of failing. And that's like if you're if you come from a good pedigree. So does that mean that it's not a good idea to start startups? No, it just means that you need a specific uh, type of personality that thrives in that environment. And I think I have that personality that thrives in the environment of uncertainty. Uncertainty for me is like an opportunity. It's, uh, you know, markets that are volatile, uh, I think are much more interesting than markets that are not volatile because like you can actually maybe figure out like cycles or, you know, interesting ways of, of uh, gaining a little bit more than the index. So yeah, uh, the elite, they just have it easy and they have the arrogance of thinking because I'm smart and because people pay me a lot of money, I can predict the future. Uh, you know, many entrepreneurs, by the way, are, are less smart, uh, but, but they're just like either more hardworking or they have more conviction or like IQ is, is just one of the many, many variables uh, that, that someone has. So yeah, that, that's, so I agree. I completely agree with Jesse's article. Yeah. And yeah, no, that was very interesting. And I, I, I agree as well there. It's, I've heard people describe entrepreneurs or like early stage startup employees as like kind of having a disease where it's like, may not be rational to join a startup or start a startup. Like the odds are completely against you, but you still want to do it anyways, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Um, and I, I kind of agree, like Bitcoin is kind of the same way. It's kind of like not really a startup, but it's in a way this, it's a new technology that a lot of people don't see, especially the, the elite and it's, you know, slowly working and, and has its crazy bull markets and has its crazy bear markets, but the trend is up. Um, so definitely interesting. And yeah, the, I remember when I like first heard about Bitcoin, like, Jesse's article made a lot of sense to me because I remember reading like the Nakamoto Institute and thinking, wow, this makes a lot of sense. Pierre is writing some really good work. Michael Goldstein is writing some really good stuff, but how could these random kids have figured this out before like the adults in the world or like the people that work in, you know, management consulting and investment making. And then Jesse's article eventually came out. And I'm like, oh, okay, this makes sense. Maybe they're actually just wrong. They're missing it. So yeah, crazy. I, yeah, Go I just ahead. wanted to say about about the Nakamoto Institute. I really love that it was it was very very seminal in my development. Uh, also, Pierre is a good friend. We worked together at Kraken. But uh, the idea is, I think Austrian economists, if you look at the the traditional ones, they were outcasts, right? So they 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 couldn't get like Rothbard. I think he he worked from Vegas. You know, he's one of the biggest minds in in economy. Like he, he, he it's it's outcasts who who think outside the box. That's the tradition of Austrian economics. And these guys from the Nakamoto Institute, they started from there. They started from the Mises. They they started like a Mises club or something in in Texas. And so it makes sense that they figured out something that most people didn't figure out because like uh, the Austrian economics stuff. It's pretty out there. Like, I love it. I, I think it's a better model. But like, if you think of the implications of some of the things that these people are advocating for, like, you know, not having a reserve, uh, you know, not having fractional reserve and like, it's just very, very radical. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but I'm saying if you are drawn to this, uh, you are more likely to understand something like Bitcoin, which is it's kind of a crazy idea if you think about it, because like Bitcoin is basically like a startup money. And money is something that is only controlled by governments in the last like hundreds of years. And just like America was like startup nation, like let's let's kick the biggest empire. Like literally they had this thought of like, we'll meet the biggest empire's army on a battlefield and we'll win. Like it, it's just like a crazy talk. So it's the same like with, with Bitcoin. I'm actually writing um, a book uh, now, which I, I have to find some time to edit, but it's called The Privatization of Money. And I'm basically trying to look at, at, at Bitcoin from a, a less radical perspective uh, and, and explain how basically any privatization, like if you have like, let's say a national telephone company, and then you privatize it. You say, okay, now people can just buy shares and you know vote for who will be the CEO and stuff like that. 
Uh, in any of those privatizations, before the government used to get 100% of the profits, and now they only get 20% of the profits or whatever the tax rate is for dividends. So, or 20, 30, I don't know, because like you also tax the salary. So let's say on average you get 30%. So you lower your, your take from 100% to 30%, and still most of the times, I mean, I, I don't know if most of the times, but in my book, I quote enough times where this was hugely successful. So a government basically goes from taking 100% of something to 30% of something, and the efficiency goes up by more than 3x. So on net, it's a good bargain for the government. And so that's the lens through which I want to look at Bitcoin as becoming global money, which is basically more and more governments just deciding to privatize the product that's called money, the product, the, the function that's called a factory that creates money, that employs like PhDs, that decide how much money to create, what conditions to put on that money, who to subsidize, who to not subsidize. All of that can like, I mean, actually subsidies you can even do on a Bitcoin standard. You can just tax people and then use some of the tax revenue to subsidize. So it's not even as radical as, as change it. Just like the production of money, let's privatize it. And guess what? If that money is much stronger, so you get more investment, you get more, like there's many, many benefits you get from having good, strong money. You could just see more and more governments literally just privatize their money and 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 do Bitcoin instead. So that's like a, a thought experiment that's a little bit less radical than than like oh yeah let's disrupt all the governments and be in a libertarian paradise that you know city states that each have their own army. You know that's I, I hope it happens, but it's it's much it's way way down the line. <laughs> yeah. No, that was I think that's really interesting framing. I'll, I'll look forward to reading that book. Um, because I, I think people that recognize that something like communism, like you said, like doesn't work, whether you live through it or like you read a history book about it, privatization of money is kind of like, you know, showing like, hey, like, let's, you know, it doesn't make sense to centrally plan the market for pens or microphones or computers. Why does it make sense to centrally plan the market for money? It's like, you know, there's not really a good answer for that. I don't, I don't, in my opinion. So uh, that, that book will be awesome. Looking forward to checking that out. Um, I guess high level, what, like, how do you compare Bitcoin to altcoins? Like, I know some people, when I originally got into the space, I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, oh, I'll buy these altcoins. And then later I recognized, like, oh, actually, Bitcoin may be more of like the true innovation here. How do you compare Bitcoin to altcoins? And how do you think about that? Hey, everyone. This week, I want to talk about Stamp Seed. This is very cool metal plate where you can literally stamp your Bitcoin seed phrase with this hammer that they sell you into this metal plate. This is a must have for all Bitcoin holders. If you have taken self custody of your Bitcoin, you wanna make sure you've recorded your seed phrase on something that is fireproof, waterproof, and time resistant. This is a great product for Bitcoiners who have taken self custody and want that extra level of security and resiliency to store their Bitcoin. So if you are interested in this product, definitely check out stampseed.com. Use code BLOCKWARE15 for 15% off the entire website. Yeah, so I mean, I, I basically think it's it's not a valid question really because it's like saying, how do you compare gold to a penny stock of uh, a shell company that went bankrupt and somebody bought it and now is working on some crazy new thing that has never existed, uh, like a robot that takes your kids to kindergarten. And so now you have a penny stock, it trades at 13 cents. If this robot gets like regulatory approval, the stock will be worth $500. So huge upside. How do you compare gold to that instrument? Like, I think you just don't, you don't compare them. It's it, They have different stated purposes, I think. The Ethereum crew is like not even talking about uh, competing on monetary policy anymore. At least I'm not seeing it so much on Twitter. Like before they used to say, oh, like our supply schedule is uh, is better, but it's like, how do we know it's not going to change? Or like, oh, like we, we people are paying us more fees. It's like, okay, but people pay a lot for shitty products in other industries. Like that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but you know, maybe they'll develop something amazing. I just don't think I have the tools to like evaluate those things. And I, and I have friends, by the way, I have a, a friend from Goldman Sachs who literally has an altcoin investment fund. Uh, he runs it out of um, out of uh, Puerto Rico and, and it's great. Like I have nothing bad to say to him, but guess what? He comes from finance. 
he knows how to evaluate those things. They write these like 20 page memos on each of these like tokens on like the thesis of when will it appreciate, when will it not appreciate. They they have a huge like, uh, you know, they talk to the founders, they get discounts. That's the other thing. Like you have to compete. So so he, here's a good answer for you of, of why I don't, I personally don't invest in altcoins. I don't invest in altcoins for the same reason that I don't pick, pick stocks. So like I'm very aggressive in my, stock investing. I actually have uh, my portfolio. It's like, let's say 50% Bitcoin, 25% leveraged NASDAQ, which is like you, you basically get double the yield of the NASDAQ per day. So you can't get margin called and 25% and leveraged S&P 500. And that portfolio I've held since, since I had money, since 2009, pretty much. So, so like, I've done really well for myself, uh, but I've never picked individual stocks because, you know, I have a friend, he has a PhD in physics. He used to work at the particle accelerator in like CERN in Switzerland, and he works on Wall Street picking stocks. So like, how am I going to compete with him? Like, I don't have the skill set. So it's the same thing with altcoins. How am I going to compete with my Goldman Sachs friend who, who literally spends all day going really, really deep on each of those assets? creating, uh, you know, personal relationships with the founders, getting discounts. And I'm not even talking about the, the shady stuff that uh, exchanges are reported to do. Uh, I have no firsthand knowledge of, of that stuff, but I've definitely seen or heard rumors of tokens saying like, hey, you know, as long as, you know, I'll pay you this marketing budget, uh, you know, for airdrops to list this token, you know, it's how, how do you like price that? How do you know what's the fair price of something? Cause like, if you don't buy on the listing date, uh, you miss out on a lot of the gains. If you buy on the listing date, you know, that probably somebody bought it at a much cheaper rate and sold to you before it got listed. And those two things are just facts. And so how, how do you operate in this environment? So that's my answer to why I don't invest in altcoins. That being said, uh, you know, both at Kraken and OKX, my view wasn't the majority view. Like many people believe in them. Many people make a lot of money on them. And I don't think it's a bad industry as long as you have the right disclosures, right? Like I, I think people should be able to buy the 13 cent penny stock of the robot that takes your kids to kindergarten. Like I think that project should be funded because I would love to have a robot that takes my kids to, to kindergarten. I just don't want to be the investor in the company. I want to buy their product. So it's the same, like if Ethereum, you know, creates this amazing smart contract that dis disrupts insurance, I will buy an insurance policy from them for sure. But I just don't, I don't have the skills to know like whether it's Ethereum or whether it's like some centralized AWS uh, thing that's faster and cheaper. Uh, you know, the, the, the biggest problem I see with like blockchain outside of Bitcoin is that literally it's hard to justify the costs. Like you have costs for operating it, you have costs for like, um, th th everything has costs that are only like with Bitcoin, it's trivial to justify those costs because like it, it, it makes it government resistant. And like, if money is not government resistant, it's not money. It's not like interesting, but like a stock, why should it be government resistant? And also like many of these projects, right? If they succeed, let's say they really, really succeed. That that's another argument that I actually haven't heard too much. I've heard the AWS is cheaper and better than, than blockchain. That I've heard a lot, but, but check, check this out. So let's say someone starts a token. It's like really successful, becomes like a $500 billion company, right? Wouldn't they want to IPO? Like, why wouldn't they want to IPO? Like I would want to IPO. It's, it just gives me access to more capital. But then once you IPO, What's the purpose of the blockchain? Because they're already control, you know, like the, the government is already controlling the trading of your stock and, and basically your capital allocation. So that, those are the two big questions. Like, why is it better than AWS? And like, is it sustainable on the long term, uh, you know, if you become really successful? And, you know, so far we haven't answered those two questions, but um, again, let's see, let's see what happens. Yeah, pretty much completely agree with all that. Um, yeah, cause it's like, okay, if you have some sort of like claim on future cash flows, like Ethereum, like you could, or IPO or not Ethereum, but whatever you could IPO and then raise money and get in cash out basically. But if you're like truly decentralized and you still create something super successful, which I, I'd say doesn't really exist quite yet, 
who says the tokens itself is going to obtain value if it has like no claim on future cash flow. So it's like, it's kind of a weird paradox where I think it's, it's such a far fetched future that maybe that something could even work and it could still not be a good investment to hold the token. Um, so very interesting stuff there broadly right now, like how are you thinking about the current macro environment and Bitcoin? I know like last year was a tough market for Bitcoin for Bitcoin miners. How are you thinking about it today? Yeah, so I mean, I'll start with my kind of short term prediction, which I've I've held since last year, since early last year, I was actually at a conference with traditional finance people in London called Das London. It's like digital asset summit, but it was mostly traditional finance people. And uh, I was on a panel there and people really didn't like what I said, <laughs> because they're traditional finance. But basically, my prediction is that for the 2024 elections, they will have to have markets at very close to all time high. Uh, j just to basically be positioned well for the election. And you're already seeing it. They're talking about like Bidenomics and all of that. So basically my, and, and this is trivial to make now, but like I made this prediction like beginning of last year when uh, before the Silicon Valley Bank collapse. I think the Silicon Valley Bank collapse was the biggest thing. Uh, it, it, it's very much akin to the COVID price drop in, in March of 2020. Because like, again, I have many friends that work in the system and it, they just didn't understand. I have a, a really good friend that was a senior executive of JP Morgan, and he had a ton of Silicon Valley stock because he worked at Silicon Valley for many years. And he didn't sell his stock. Uh, like, he didn't see it. Uh, and, you know, I was, you know, so many times we would get together because I, I lived, I, I live in DC now, but I used to live in San Francisco for 10 years. So we would get together like on, Saturday nights or whatever, and we'll, we'll just talk about the markets and everything. And I said, guys, like these interest rates, they're not sustainable. Like if you buy bonds now, they're guaranteed to crash. Like it's th this low interest rate is just going to create inflation because they printed all this money. And it's it's crazy. You get now Christine Lagarde saying, oh, yeah, the inflation pretty much came out of nowhere. And I was like, yeah, if by out of nowhere, you mean by the hard drive of the computer where you just like added the zeros to the to the money supply or whatever. Yeah, it is kind of out of nowhere, but like, it's very clear that you created more money. And it doesn't matter if you basically say, hey, all of your balance sheet, we can give you a 30% premium on that, which is like the BTFP program. They basically said, hey, whatever collateral you have, guess what? Now overnight, it's worth 30% more or 20% more or wherever it was that the difference between the value and the par value of these bonds, that's injecting tons of money. And, and that's not, you don't even have to print the money, just like promising that, you know, like that's one thing I took a, a course in my MBA called money markets and the fed. And it was, it was uh, taught by someone who worked at the federal reserve and it's fascinating uh, how it works. But like the, the main thing is that it is true that the main driver of inflation is inflation expectations, not necessarily any other factor. But then that's where they stop. They don't ask what creates inflation expectations, you know? And so like what creates inflation expectations is exactly programs like the BTFP that basically say, hey, like, you know, uh, guess what? You just have 30% more money on your balance sheet overnight. So, so like, yeah, I think they'll just create more and more liquidity now into the, uh, up to the election. What will happen after the election? It's hard to know because it's really, I think it, it really matters uh, who wins because uh, it's not so much about anything else. I think it's just about the war in Ukraine because like the war in Ukraine is a huge drag on the global economy. Like, uh, you know, we're losing so many lives. It's so heartbreaking. We're losing uh, so much, you know, ammunition and stuff that will have to be, you know, uh, rebuilt. And, and the, the shitty thing is like, and this is where I completely... Don't not only do I disagree with the Keynesian view, but I, I completely think that Keynes was like ridiculous. Like, how can you even come up with it? You know, the broken windows fallacy. Have you ever heard of the broken? So like yeah. this is the war in Ukraine. It's like people say, oh, now we're going to have to produce more like anti-tank missiles because we're out of them in artillery shells. This is great. It's like, no, you just destroyed them by exploding them on the enemy. And now you have to rebuild them. It's exactly like the broken window fallacy. So I think that. The sooner this war ends, the quicker the actual economic growth can uh, can recover. So, you know, that nobody can tell. I wish, you know, if, if I could tell that, I would be a billionaire and not be talking to you right now. But, um, but yeah, so I think 
long term, I'm very optimistic because I think AI and all these, it, not just AI, even um, this is another thing I, I said at the panel there in London that people hated, which is like, I think the biggest good thing of the war in Ukraine, which there's tons of really bad things, but the biggest good thing is that uh, people will start thinking of energy sovereignty and they'll start thinking of energy uh, reliability and, and how to like not depend on one single source of failure uh, for your energy needs, which will create cheaper energy costs. So that's my other prediction. Like, you know, 10 years from now, energy will be cheaper in real terms uh, than right now, which means that maybe everything else will be cheaper because like everything else is downstream from energy. And so it's really hard to say. Uh, basically, yeah, overall, I think the the huge amount of debt that we have is going to have to be inflated away, like 100%, just because uh, in democracies, people just vote for the short term. So it's like really hard. Imagine someone had now, uh, let's say you had uh, Trump and Biden and RFK Jr. And then Shimon runs for president. And my platform is I'm going to stop the money printing. Prices will collapse. Everybody will lose their job. But it will be amazing for long term growth. Like we'll have 10% GDP growth after that. Um, you know, I'm still considering it, but I'm not very optimistic about my chances of being elected. And so that's like in, in all democracies, people just vote for more things in the short term. They can't really see the long term implications. So they'll have to inflate the debt away. The question is, will there be deflation that makes up for that inflation? Or will it just be a massacre of like, you know, prices going up by like 20% year over year? I don't know. I hope I'm an optimistic guy. So I hope that humans know how to solve problems over the long term. Um, I had a professor once that said like, you know, look at Europe now versus, well, maybe now it's not a good uh, example because they're fighting with Russia, but like until the war with Russia, you know, the Europeans were fighting among each other for like thousands of years, literally. And now we have a European union that doesn't fight each other. So, you know, we should be able to deal with, with, uh, just like, let's build a bunch of nuclear power plants. Let's, start manufacturing things at scale. I'm very bullish on like Elon Musk. Uh, one of the things that are really good about him is because he's so, he's both wealthy and motivated. You don't usually see that combination. Like you look at someone like a Warren Buffett, and he'll just like, he's wealthy. So why does he need the risk of investing in like weird things? Versus Elon Musk is both wealthy and motivated. So he can say, okay, I'm going to build robots that will disrupt factory workers, you know? Guess why nobody did it until now? Because it's very politically unpopular, you know, because the unions are very strong. And so, you know, the White House has like a electric vehicle appreciation. They, they don't even invite Tesla like it's clown world. Uh, but it makes perfect sense because the unions are the ones that support the Democrats. So, of course, they're not going to, uh, you know, invite someone who hurts truck drivers or whatever. So, like, those are the forces that will happen over the next uh, couple of years. Which force will be stronger? I cannot predict. I can just hope that the technology will win. Uh, I'm very optimistic by the fact that the NASDAQ is like close to its all time high. I think it's a fantastic sign. And I really don't mind that it's concentrated in the top companies because if you think of it, the top companies are basically like funds that buy up a bunch of startups. Like it's not, it's not like they make one product and they have like 30% of the NASDAQ. No, it's like they make so many things. And so, yeah, hopefully we can just like inflate the debt away and then just like have enough real growth to make up for it without the CPI being too, uh, too, too impacted. Yeah, I like it. I mean, I think that would be a great outcome and I could definitely see that happening. I mean, um, what, do you think? what do I think? My, optimistically, I think that that's pretty reasonable. I think technology is like extremely deflationary and like Jeff Booth, his thesis is, is playing out. I think times are weird. Like things are changing really fast on technologies front on like a political front on like a global front. So like we could probably do some weird, crazy things and there's probably going to be an extreme amount of volatility, but I think in the end, Bitcoin's going to win. And, and I think like if, if there are like out, like, uh, like crazy things that happen or like, you know, we do have a physically responsible government for a short period of time. I feel like those people will just be like voted out of office, honestly. And then we'll go back to the money printer, go bird. Like, I feel like the path is kind of set for what's going to play out. It's just a matter of like, how far will we deviate and then get pushed back to like the natural path of like how, how money should work and how free markets would just bring the world to the place that it should be. And I think Bitcoin will help do that. Um, yeah. So yeah, 
before we wrap up, I want to ask you, like, what's the importance of self-custody and let you, you know, talk about Unchained for a little bit? Yeah, so I think basically the if we zoom out a little bit, uh, the first banks were just goldsmiths that had a good safe deposit box for their jewelry. And people would like deposit their jewelry there and get a receipt against it. So burglars wouldn't like steal it from your house. And then people started trading those receipts. And then people started like borrowing against those receipts. And that's how the banking system started. It's all built on a very, very strong place to store your wealth. Now, Unchained is trying to do the same thing, which is like the, the, we are doing some decisions that are very counterintuitive. And I don't know if people know about that, but for example, the reason why all the other people that where you could borrow against your Bitcoin, they all went bankrupt. And except for exchanges, that's a different story. But like all the companies where that was their business model, they went bankrupt and and we didn't and we're thriving. The reason is because we are super, super conservative, which means we charge a lot more. So we charge like more than 10% uh, if you want to borrow against your Bitcoin. And um, Coinbase back in the day, now they don't have that program anymore, but they, they could you could borrow against it for like 6% or 7%. The reason is because we don't do anything with your Bitcoin. You still hold the key. Uh, it's a two out of three. So, you know, like you hold one key, we hold one key, and then a third party holds one key. And so if you get a margin call, so if you like borrow a bunch of money against your Bitcoin, and the price crashes. If you cannot send us more Bitcoin, we can use the two out of three to liquidate you. But, but we cannot do anything else with this Bitcoin. And so we just go to Wall Street, we raise dollars, we, we borrow money from Wall Street, and then we give you that money, and make a spread. That's a much more conservative way of growing the business, but that's what allowed us to stay alive. And I think uh, people really appreciate that. So we have relationships with some of the wealthiest people, like the Unchained customers are, you know, the, the large Bitcoiners. And I would say, unless you have the engineers to build your own solution for multi-sig, uh, I think the recent events, like if you look at Prime Trust and all of these things, uh, it wasn't a technical failure. It was just like a, a human failure. And that's what's nice about Unchained. We cannot have a human failure because we use multi-sig that's native and you literally hold the key. So even if we wanted, like even if we had a rogue employee that wanted to steal your bit, even if we were hacked, all of that doesn't matter to you. Uh, and so we take a very long-term approach. We, we, we grew much more slowly than than a block five, for example. But uh, but we really want to build this company to be like you know hundreds of years, uh, basically being the premier premier normal financial services that you would get from any bank on top of Bitcoin. Uh, and and it's very powerful. It's a powerful concept if you think about it, because like because Bitcoin is such a good collateral and it can be liquidated really quickly. It means that all the financial services that you're currently getting from your bank, in theory, we should be able to give it at much better terms uh, to Bitcoiners. So it's it's going to be a long process because we're trying to do everything like, you know, get all the licenses and, you know, we have to be really embedded with the traditional financial system. Uh, we I, I like to think of, of um, Unchained as like a yin and yang symbol where the one of them is Bitcoin, the other one is traditional finance and like we kind of have a good blend of both. Uh, I, and I think a product like that should exist. And what's really nice is I think all the new products like BlackRock and all of these like Fidelity, they cannot compete with us because like they will not let customers hold their own key um, for various reasons. But I, I just think I, I have no way of knowing that. But like just like coming from that um, industry, I would be very, very surprised if they started a service where like you could hold your own key and still have it with them for many reasons. Uh, but yeah, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be the premier place for Bitcoiners to come to us and secure, you know, you can secure your Bitcoin with multi-sig. It, it's almost free or it's completely free. Or you can like, we have premium services like we just launched yesterday, a ultra high net worth tier called Unchained Signature, where you get to interact with like thought leaders in the space. You get like, you know, a bunch of things, people can check it out. But the biggest thing about Unchained is we're trying to be very, very conservative in how we run the business uh, because yeah, we believe that Bitcoin is going to be uh, here for the very long run. And so like, as long as we can just stay alive and provide good service to people over time, we'll figure out how to make money, you know, uh, how to make a lot of money. Uh, we don't need to like go after the short term, like low hanging fruit, you know, 
uh, have our token. If you hold our token, you get more interest on your deposit. Like who does that? I, it, <laughs> it's just like some of the things that happened in 2022 are just like so crazy. Uh, I'm talking about something like a Nexo. It's like, oh, you get 5%, but if you hold our token, you get 6%. What could possibly go wrong under that like incentive structure? <laughs> like, yeah. Exactly. I definitely admire the conservative approach. And I think that applies well to the Bitcoin ethos of, you know, not moving fast and breaking things when it comes to money or, or your savings or your career. Right. So yeah, that's awesome. Um, where can people find more about you and Unchained after they watch this? Yeah. So, uh, go to unchanged.com. You can see all of our products there. And, uh, I'm, uh, Shimon Lazarov at tw on Twitter and unchained, uh, unchained, uh, on Twitter. You can find us too. Those are the base, uh, the best places. And, and we're trying to do more thought leadership now. So follow our Twitter account and our blog, because like, uh, I think you're going to be happy with some of the pieces that are going to come out, uh, over the next couple of months. I can't exactly tell you what they are, but I think they'll be very, uh, very interesting. Nice. Great to hear. Uh, thanks, Shimon. This was awesome. Really interesting episode. Yeah. Thanks so much, Joe. It was a pleasure. Absolutely.